Good morning and good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jens Liebe, team leader for innovation and the future of TVET here at UNESCO Univoc. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar on social aspects of digital learning in TVET. As a response to COVID-19, in many countries, TVET had shifted very abruptly to distance learning and on online implementation. And this quick shift has put a heavy burden on both teachers and students alike. Today, we've come together to discuss issues arising from this shift that have gone beyond the technical challenges. And it's great to see that so many of you have joined us today. Before we get started with our webinar, I would like to let you know that this event is being recorded and that interpretation is available in French and in Spanish. So if you would like to listen in one of those languages, please select the respective audio channel. We also recommend that English speakers uh, select the English channel to benefit from the interpretation later during an intervention that will be given in Spanish in the panel. I would now like to invite Sue Choi, director of UNESCO Univoc, for her welcome remarks. Sue, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jens. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening uh, around the world. Welcome to the webinar on the social aspects of digital learning in Tibet. This webinar is the second one, and I trust that some of you may have attended the first one, but second in a series of three webinars, we are planning all devoted to the issue of digitalization and Tibet. And this webinar is series is provided in tandem with the three months of training on training program and digitalization that we are offering to Tibet teachers in five countries. All these activities, the webinars and the training are generously supported and financed by GIJ, the German International Development Agency, and implemented by our office with the technical support of the Omnia Education Partnerships, the international commercial arm of the Finnish Univoc Center, Omnia. We thank them all. Digitalization is one of the most visible impacts of the pandemic and Tibet has now been shielded from this force majeure. While we often talk about the technological aspects and the challenges, there is one area of digitalization in Tibet that we overlook. And that is the social dimension of distance learning and teaching. This webinar is look at that, discussing the psychological and social support that teachers and students need to work digitally in physical isolation. So I wish you all a very useful learning experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue, for welcoming our participants. As Sue has just mentioned, uh, the webinar is made possible through the generous support of GIZ. And I'm happy to invite Jeanette Burmeister head of the sector project TVET at GIZ to open our webinar with an intervention. Janet? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jens. Thank you very much, Sue. I'm very happy, again, to be part of this kind of webinars. And good afternoon to all the participants from all over the world. I'm greeting you from Bonn from Germany. I want to congratulate the team of UNESCO UNOVOC again for organizing this very important webinar. Vocational education and training is a prominent topic and has been long part of the German development cooperation with partner countries. And our collaboration and partnership with you, with UNESCO UNOVOC is one example of this. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, for more than one year, the COVID-19 pandemic dominates all our lives now. We learned already to digitalize teaching and learning as fast as we could. Some of us adapted quite quickly to the new normal, but some of us are struggling. Especially now that we see the crisis is ongoing, we really need to make sure to leave no one behind. So far, as so already said, the focus has been very much on digital tools and adapting our lives to them but there are other aspects to teaching and learning digitally. So we are very pleased to see UNESCO UNIVOC in shedding a light on the social aspects of digital learning in Tibet today. Already the last webinar, you had about interventions and new approaches being experimented in delivering Tibet services across projects was very, very inspiring and impressive. But today we want to take a deeper look into the changes that come with e-learning and e-training. It is a fact that we cannot transfer face-to-face -face learning one by one to the digital world. 
the proper knowledge of how to set up interactive, inclusive, inclusive and supportive digital TVET is still missing widely. I have to admit in Germany and as well as in many other countries. Many teachers and trainers lack still the skills to conceptualize meaningful online courses. Using video conferences, systems and digital learning materials are already challenging. It takes even more effort to create an online learning community that functions in a concentrated and trustful manner. Additional changes come with practical work based learning in TVET. This is a speciality of TVET. A lot of things have to be um, felt with the hands and have to be um, very active and it's very difficult to transport it through online teaching. The screens, now everybody is sitting uh, half a day at least in front of the screen. The screens create new barriers between teachers and learners and also between the learners themselves especially those learners who are not familiar with the digital world need much more support. Some learners lack a calm working atmosphere and they get easily distracted when learning alone, even more so for those learners with special needs. Some are overstrained with written tasks because their reading and writing skills might be low. Some are excluded because of their disabilities. We need to listen to learners and teachers alike. We need to understand better what are their individual challenges and what can be the solutions which work for all. So what do we need to keep in mind, in mind when setting up inclusive digital pedagogies? Setting up digital TVET systems that are inclusive requires more effort than just providing digital infrastructure. So has mentioned this also already. Digital learning comes with a new culture with much more flexibility and multiple new methodological possibilities. There are a lot of options also. It also requires more responsibility of the individual learner. The individuals have to become more self-confident. People should not feel lost in the virtual world. Therefore, a learner-centered design is needed. This means that we focus on the interest and skills of the learners to incorporate different styles and paces in e-learning. Many models of, high of hybrid and blended learning are being discussed currently. This entails a thorough combination of synchronous learning, it means all learn in the virtual workshop together and further accompanied by individual learning at home, which is then um, unsynchronous. The good news is that there are already plenty of tools available for this kind of learning. For example, Atingi, this is initiative under BMZ's Africa Cloud approach. It offers free learning resources to learners, job seekers, teachers and trainers for self uh, paced learning beside other initiatives. Peer-to-peer -peer support is, of, is very often underestimated. Structures beyond IT support are needed for learners to self-regulate learning, exchange ideas for collaboratively and collaboratively find solutions. Let us explore the opportunities in digital TVET and make use of them, including the possibilities created by peer learning. It can be a great way to ensure TVET throughout the crisis. And I think it is maybe a sneak preview into our future of learning already. So dear ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, I'm looking forward to hearing today also interesting practices and discussions on different approaches in today's webinar. And I wish us a very um, successful and interesting day. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Jeanette, for opening our webinar and for providing a great framing for our discussion today. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. Now it's time to move to our panel discussion, the main part of our webinar, and I would like to introduce to you once again our moderator, Melvi Jansson, who you may remember from our last webinar. She's the CEO of Omnia Education Partnership in Finland, uh, our implementation partner in this activity, and I'm passing the floor to her to introduce our international panel of speakers to you, 
Mervi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jens. It's indeed a pleasure to welcome the audience and of course our panelists to our panel discussion on social aspects of digital learning in TVET. We have four distinguished panelists who are looking forward to sharing their experiences, highlighting what they have learned about the social aspects uh, of digital learning. And um, I'd like to actually start before we go to our panel to um, look at the webinar functions, just to make sure everybody is comfortable with the, with, with the yeah. webinar. So as you can see here, um, we have a chat window, we have a Q&A box, and then we have the interpretation as Jens mentioned. So if you have any questions for the panelists or for UNESCO UNEVOC, please type them in the Q&A window. We'll address as many questions as possible at the end, but also colleagues from UNESCO UNEVOC will actually be answering questions during the webinar. And of course, you can use the chat to share information and links with other attendees and use the chat box. I noticed that there was a comment that the um, the Spanish was not the Spanish interpretation was not um, vocal enough. I hope that's okay now. If there are any issues, please type in the chat box and we'll be happy to address them. Um, I'd now like to ask our panelists to shortly introduce themselves, and I'd like to start with Denise, please. Okay, hello, good morning or good evening, bonjour, bonsoir, buenos dias, buenos tardes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you uh, today. I'm Denise Amio. I'm the President CEO of Colleges Institutes Canada. It's a national association, uh, including all CEGEPs, uh, all uh, polytechnics, uh, all uh, colleges, as well as institutes, and 15 universities that also provide TVET training. So it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you, Denise. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Yanni, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you and good evening all. My name is Yanni Kuman and I come from Finland. I work in, in the Finnish Education Evaluation Center, FINEC. And FINEC is responsible for external evaluation of education in Finland. And FINEC carries out evaluations at all levels of education, from early childhood education to higher education. And I work as an evaluation counselor in FINEC, and my task is to lead evaluation projects, especially related in TIFET. And uh, it's great and uh, uh, nice to attend this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Yanni. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, Sibu Siso, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you so much, uh, maybe for the introduction. So my name is Sibu Siso Moyo, and so good afternoon to everybody. I know it's afternoon in South Africa, but um, I, I, I think it's morning and uh, it could be night in some places, but uh, just to, to say hello to everybody and greetings from the South. So my, 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 my name is Mrs. Omoy, as I mentioned, I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Innovation and Engagement at Deben University of Technology. But I also um, I'm responsible for a number of engagements with the TVET sector. So we, um, we have a network within our region um, I also uh, serve on a number of NGOs that promote science. I'm a mathematician by background, so I am very interested in supporting students also in terms of uh, the teaching and learning of maths and science as well. So I'm looking forward to this webinar and just trying to understand as well um, what others are experiencing and also going through because in our context, we also have very interesting situations. I'm sure we can learn from each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sipu Siso. And last but not least, Paola. Hello, 
¿Qué tal? Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches desde Uruguay. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Uruguay. It's a huge pleasure, pleasure to be here with you. Let me introduce myself. My name is Paola Vilar. First of all, I'm a literature and Spanish teacher. I have specialized in learning difficulties and education technologies. I am presently the teaching advisor at the General Directorate of Secondary Education, and I provide guidance to education centers throughout the country. Additionally, I work at SAVAL, it's an education plan, and through today's conversations, I will let you in on what SAVAL does. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Paola. So again, welcome to all of our panelists. And we have a sort of a virtual fifth panelist. So we have a short video that we would li now like to present, giving the voice to students. Of course, it's not the same as as um, uh, in real real social interactions. So I, I really miss the real when I see the teacher or my students when I see their um, the eye contact, the the body language, the faces of them, um, and um, I, I really miss that lack of interaction and uh, not being in class was a bit hard for me. Uh, in class, it's easy because, you know, uh, even if there is this, um, let's say, misunderstanding or any um, situation, then there you have always that eye to eye contact and body language that can explain so many things. But uh, when you see only the, the, the camera and sometimes people don't turn their cameras on, so it can be like only a picture or something. And then you're you you have the feeling that you are talking to yourself sometimes and it can be very, very hard. There was some low points where I really didn't feel that motivated, but uh, again, like uh, we really have to cope with that situation and we try to find some other solutions to finish the tasks and so on. I can say that sometimes it may feel a bit lonely being uh, like at home uh, and not communicating with uh, like with classmates or teachers or I would say the downside is that uh, because we all group started as, as this remote studies, uh, we haven't met each other. Sometimes it was hard to reach uh, the teacher when you had the problem, especially if it's homework. Uh, during the lessons, it's, it's uh, much easier to ask. But if it's homework and you get stuck, mm, then when do you actually reach the teacher and do they have time to help you? But during our lessons, um, we were asked sometimes, but sometimes we also did it voluntarily that we uh, switched on our mic, uh, uh, our cameras on, and we tried to discuss uh, sometimes some um, uh, like um, um, side talks as if we are in class, for example, and sometimes the the, the, the teachers try also to soften the, the atmosphere a bit uh, in order not to feel that we are in a very serious um, work at atmosphere or something. So, yeah. We have used, uh, we, we use the cameras and microphones a lot uh, in, in a different kind of situations. And uh, it is really um, something that will give a new level to our studying and I think that the uh, fact that we were uh, we received uh, laptops with uh, such good quality microphone and um, camera, it really helps that uh, we have really high quality equipment. We are almost 30 students and maybe 10 people are using cameras uh, plus the teachers. So I think I know the people who are using the cameras better because you sort of get to know something else but the voice i would like uh, maybe to um, to ask the teachers to create like more opportunities where 
um, we can make like an effective social uh, or develop our social skills, for example. Um, that would be uh, really more effective because we definitely need that. Yes, I wish maybe that uh, it's uh, our teachers sometimes they ask like some questions not related to the studies. Okay, how everyone is feeling? Do you feel good? Do you feel because I feel sometimes uh, that it's nice to talk also about something else, not just studies all the time. One good thing about this is that we really uh, learn different uh, ways to cope with uh, uh, different kind of situations as students, and we learn to like handle these kind of situations. Uh, when I was in the class, maybe I didn't ask so many questions, but when I was online, I just <laughs> I just asked many questions and. Uh, it, it uh, positively affect my studies. Uh, not being in class allowed me uh, also like to be more uh, responsible that there there is no one there then I am the only responsible for uh, my study pace and accomplishment of my uh, assignments and so on. So um, I kind of de developed some new parts of my personality that I didn't uh, really, I was not aware that I had them. So some of, some views and experiences from students. I think it's always uh, good to hear the student's voice because after all, vocational education and training is about the students, about supporting them. But uh, now we'd like to hear from our audience and our audience's experience. We have um, a good audience, over 200 participants already. So in order to hear from you, we're using a polling tool called Mentimeter. Very easy to use. We have four questions and um, we will be using Mentimeter. It's easy to use via the chat link in the chat or the QR code that should be provided now, voila. So here are the questions and here is the QR code to access Mentimeter. Now you can go ahead and answer all four questions and then we will view the, the um, answers um, when we go on with the panel. So the first question is, has the social challenges aspect actually been raised in connection with digital learning in your country? And if you can answer the yes and no in Mentimeter. Second question is, how well have vocational teachers and student support needs been addressed during the COVID-19 pandemic in your country? And third question, do you have good practices for mitigating the social challenges of online learning in your country? And in your opinion, question number four, has teachers' workload actually increased during the COVID-19 pandemic in your country? So we'll take just a few minutes so that you can um, access Mentimeter and please answer the four questions. So we'll start our panel um, talking about social challenges. And uh, before I give the floor to our panelists, let's view what are the results of our first poll question from Mentimeter. So it looks like social challenges have been raised in quite a few of the countries. So 80% of our uh, audience members say that, um, yes, this aspect has been raised. And um, now I'd like to turn to Sibu Siso. 
what are some of the social challenges related to digital learning and um, how can we mitigate these challenges? Could you share some of your views and experience, please? Yes, please. Thank you so much. And it's also good to see um, uh, what other colleagues are saying around this. So um, in the South African context, actually, when we talk about um, um, these social challenges, um, the first thing that comes to mind from my experience uh, just dealing with uh, different schools and also uh, the university and Tibet sector is on the social divide um, and the digital divide as well. Um, uh, many of our students actually, um, uh, at least most of them who come from uh, underprivileged families uh, uh, have faced a very difficult time in terms of even trying to access the basics that you may take for granted in certain situations. So like connectivity. So they may have a device, they may have a laptop, they may have data, but they are not able to connect because the infrastructure is not the same across the, the country itself. In some cases also, it is the access just to the basics, uh, the, the data itself, and also devices. Some don't have enough devices. So what we've noticed is that the same sense of um, feeling that, um, you know, being insecure because the feeling that if I don't have the device, then how will I access uh, the learning materials? That is one. And then two, even if I have the device, how do I make sure that I find a place where I can connect? So you'll find that in our cases, we've had to bring some students back to the campus, even under the COVID-19 alerts when they are quite high, because it's the only way that students could at least stay in the residences in order to access um, you know, the teaching and learning materials. Uh, because the infrastructure for IT is not the same everywhere. So there have been issues of also of self-isolation um, where we, we do get students who uh, may become suicidal or you know, just not having the support that is needed. And so those, uh, th that also has been a concern. So apart from providing the teaching and learning materials, we realized that we needed to set up a unit which can help students with their social problems and other types of experiences some students have come from families where they've experienced loss. Uh, they've lost their breadwinners, people who would have cared for them for their education. So that experience as well has been uh, really concerning in our case. Um, uh, for the portfolio that I'm responsible in the university, we had to set up a fund where we asked the staff to also contribute. We asked people who could contribute from the society. We called it a COVID-19 fund. And then from that, we've been able to kind of assist a few students. I mean, it hasn't, uh, the, the burden is very high, but we've been able to assist some in terms of being able to access some, um, just the basics, devices, uh, data, and then also in some cases, also uh, meal allowances where they are not able to, to, to cope with that. So the issues around that and, um, the other part is, uh, you know, the, the, the feeling of uh, not being sure and in, insecurity and uh, not knowing exactly what the future holds has not just touched the students. I mean, even the academic staff, the lecturers have experienced a lot of uh, also uncertainty because from the management side, every, every other week or every other, other month, some conditions may change. Um, so we call the digital learning, we've actually, uh, we use a bimodal learning because we know that in our case, uh, we have to use both the contact sessions for people who need practical type of support, and then also the virtual um, uh, sessions for those uh, programs where the students can learn remotely. So I think just from the issue of social aspects of digital learning, we did see from the video clip, um, the experiences are not so different from uh, you know, students feeling that I don't see my friends, I miss my friends, and then also the networking uh, opportunities of uh, being in class with other students, uh, make sure that uh, students learn soft skills, which help them to network and liaise with other students. So for, from my side, those have been the challenges. Now, how we can mitigate, I mentioned that um, it's very important to set up units that help students also from the social aspects. Uh, and other emotional type of support that is needed because, and the counseling, the counseling is also important uh, because those parts, uh, you cannot really manage to do them all as the academic or the teacher that is teaching. Uh, you need this uh, type of support. The other thing has been to set up social innovation hub. So for example, in our case, what we've tried to do is distract students from just the normal schoolwork 
Uh, we, we do support a lot of entrepreneurship. So what we're trying to do is we bring students together with great ideas. So this, uh, through these social innovation hubs, they can actually identify a social problem, which they, they as a group, they work out to try and find those solutions. So I can probably talk a little bit more um, about that later um, and give my colleagues a chance to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Sipu Siso. You've done amazing things. The social innovation hub sounds wonderful. And I'm sure that um, we would all benefit from uh, your sharing more of that experience. If there is a link or something that um, we could view online, please feel free to share it in the chat because um, I, again, I would like to find out more. And I'm sure that uh, many of our um, audience viewers would also like to hear more about um, the social innovation hub and uh, it seems that the multiple aspects of support which are needed are quite universal but um, Denise would you like to comment how is Absolutely. the situation in Canada? Absolutely thank you Sibusi so, uh, thank you um, so first I should say happy herd day <laughs> Um, so, uh, like Sibusi so said, the social divide, the anxiety, the lack of funds has affected learners, but also uh, faculty. Uh, what is important also is that it has impacted different groups of people differently, but especially women and vulnerable groups. So for us in Canada, the biggest social challenges uh, related to digital learning is really access to education. You can see in my background, the map of Canada. As you know, we are one of the largest country uh, in the world. And uh, so this comes with issues, especially on the digital front. Um, why? Because first, digital access. So you may be surprised to learn that not everyone here in Canada has access to computers or internet access, particularly in low income communities, indigenous communities, rural or remote communities. And this was not only for learners, but sometimes faculty. Some have had to sit in their cars in parking lots to access Wi-Fi. So the second one still linked to access is digital literacy and transitioning uh, hands-on programs to digital learning approaches. Because we know when we talk about TVET, it's all about hands-on. So it is a challenge when we have to move online. So, and especially in trades and in apprenticeship. So uh, much uh, what we had to do, uh, we had to offer uh, this kind of offering in very small groups while respecting social distancing, uh, which meant that sometimes uh, a course had to be repeated four times to accommodate a regular class. The third one linked to access is online learning modality doesn't work for everyone. And especially people that have, uh, for example, physical or learning disabilities or mental health problems. And so online learning is not always the best option. So it means we need to find ways to ensure that students uh, feel uh, accompanied and not isolated. We heard the students earlier in their testimonies. So what did we do in Canada? So uh, some of the initiatives are similar to what Cebu CISO uh, has talked about. So I will talk about others. So for example, we prioritize digital equity initiatives. So I'll give just some examples. So for example, internet connectivity supports, technology equipment loan programs. We had dedicated campus access for those students that needed a place to go to, to study. Uh, we had Wi-Fi vouchers. Uh, drive up uh, Wi-Fi parking lots on campuses and also relief funds, a bit like what Sibuso said, and even uh, food hampers. 
The second thing that we saw was to offer micro credentials uh, or short courses to boost digital literacy skills for both faculty and learners. Um, the, the third one was to provide access to key learning software on the cloud because uh, we needed to facilitate access for students who did not have high performing computers, for example. And fourth, um, we, we, because hands-on is so important in TVET, we created digital learning tools using simulation, augmented reality, or virtual reality. But we know that those are expensive. So my own association currently is developing with our members such tools in augmented and virtual reality in three health professions, and those will be available to all our members. And the last one that I will talk about, because some of the students, uh, not students, but Janet talked about it earlier. What we did, we, we offered virtual mentorship a virtual counseling and what we called virtual wraparound supports for students facing barriers. For example, in our country, indigenous leaders play a very important role for indigenous people. So we had to teach and many indigenous elders, in fact, to use Zoom uh, in order to be able to support students. So I'll stop here. Thank you. It certainly sounds like you've had an array of tools and approaches, whatever is needed to support the students and the learning, which is wonderful. I know that in Finland, we've also had special needs students come to campus um, in small groups and also virtual reality has been explored here. So I'm sure that a lot of the solutions have been quite global and it would be great to hear and, and actually explore more. But let's go to our second question, which is specifically on support needs. And that will first view the um, results of the second poll question. And uh, here it seems that um, we could have done a better job. <laughs> so basically support needs have been addressed poorly or not at all in about a third of the um, participants or the audience's uh, responses. Um, I'm very sad to hear that. Of course, you know, the situation took everybody by surprise and um, there's no hindsight here, but um, we just have to try and um, learn from each other and see what we can do better in the future. And uh, now I'd like to go to our second question, Yanni. I know that there have been several surveys actually conducted in Finland. What do we know about the teachers and the student support needs that have emerged and uh, some of the solutions? Could you please share some of the results? Yes, of course, thank you. Uh, about a year ago in Finland, all educational institutions switched to distance learning and face-to-face uh, -face teaching was suspended. And this was a familiar situation in many countries in the world. And uh, my organization, Pinek, carried out an evaluation project between March 2020 and January 2021. And uh, this evaluation project did cover all levels of ed education, but now I describe a few results of event. And uh, indeed, we carried out a survey in event for students and teachers and study counselors and education providers. And about 6,500 students responded to our survey and almost 2,300 teachers and study counselors responded our, our survey. 
And we found that that some of students had problems with sufficient study equipment. They did not have a computer or a good internet connection, but most of students had sufficient equipment and there was no problem in this. And uh, good thing, uh, thing is, is that uh, many of those students who lacked a computer, they got a computer loan from their Tibet institution. Not all, but quite many. Most students felt that studying during COVID-19 time has been more stressful than studying in normal times. And it's quite natural uh, that this is the case. But a worrying is that about a quarter, so one part of four of the students had a lot of problems in their studies because of the circumstances caused by COVID-19. And um, these students' uh, problems were accumulated. So many different problems were occurred together. They had uh, problems related to motivation, stress, strain, and progress of studies. Some of them had loneliness and lack of mates. And these students felt that their study skills were not good enough for distance learning. And uh, these stu students felt that they did not get enough support and guidance during distance learning. And so what was learned, it is very important to help those students who have a lot of problems and models and methods that support students' well-being and reduce their mental strain and stress should be developed further. As well, it is important to support learning capabilities and learning skills of students at all levels of education. Um, in Finland, we have developed distance learning and have used digital learning environments already before COVID time, for example, because of uh, long distance distances in our country. And we have a good level of technology and know how. But this COVID time showed development of needs as well in distance learning and teaching. And um, teachers felt that it is very difficult to maintain communality and feeling of togetherness with students because there was no face to face teaching and no student interaction as usual. So, to, uh, Digital and pedagogical competencies of teaching and guidance staff should be developed and create better ways to maintain communality and feeling of togetherness in a digital learning environments. Um, here were a few, few perspectives on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Yanni. Um... If we consider that 25% of the Finnish uh, vocational students felt isolated and had accumulated problems, Sibusi, so how does this compare with your findings? And um, what was basically the role of the Social Innovation Hub in trying to mitigate some of these issues? Uh, thank you so much for that, and uh, thank you so much, Annie, for those um, also comments in terms of the study. I think this is very interesting to compare the results. We haven't done a country study. There's a number of studies now which are looking at, um, you know, data, trying to do um, some work around teaching and learning experiences of students during COVID-19. Uh, so we don't have definite results, but at the university itself, we had a, um, the institution of art, we had a small survey which was done. And uh, we found generally that uh, I, I don't have an exact figure in terms of percentages, but what we know is that a lot of the students, uh, you know, we have over 80% of our students come from um, uh, families within our region, which are underprivileged. And just to explain that a lot of them depend on government loans, you know, government funding, uh, uh, which is the national students uh, aids, uh, uh, sorry, financial aid scheme. Uh, which helps students, you know, to, to get into tertiary education. 
Um, and a lot of those students, uh, I mean, were very anxious and uh, worried about, um, you know, just making sure they have access to uh, connectivity, to data and to devices. So it's three things. Um, but then also on the social aspect side, I mean, we, we've had cases where we could see that uh, part of the stress, uh, and I don't know what it's like in Finland, translates into um, student protests. And our protests can be very violent. And so, you know, when you talk about uh, the state of mental health and what people are going through, um, it's, a, it's, I think, in our case, it's a very big issue. And we need to just make sure that we collect information, uh, evidence-based information to understand what causes that, why our protests very violent. Of course, students have issues to raise about their experiences, but um, again, understanding that how does one raise these issues without being extremely violent. So what, what I still think is that um, it's very important for, um, you know, for us, we realize that to set up the, uh, counseling uh, units where we can, you know, students can receive counseling services, but also support in terms of um, making sure that they can get the support they need when they have issues. Um, and in the residences, we, we opened up some of our residences for smaller groups of students to come on campus, especially those who, were, who had to do practical work, you know, in the engineering, as you say, Tibet is about doing, uh, you know, practical work. Uh, so in those cases, even the residence advisors have to be very alert to these issues to make sure that the students are getting the help that is needed. Um, but in terms of just uh, understanding well, uh, you know, what can be done in, in making sure that our students stay creative, because remember, um, well, in our case, our strategy talks about uh, making sure our, our students are agile. That means that even if the situation changes when they graduate, they can still adapt to change because COVID-19 has taught us that things can change rapidly. Um, the other thing is how do we make sure that they're creative and how do we set up um, um, uh, the curriculum so that they have chances to experience some practical work where they can work with other people, not just from South Africa, but also outside the country. So what the Social Innovation Hub does, it is a virtual platform, but it brings together people from all different walks of life. So it can be uh, students from our universities, students from other countries, uh, uh, people from industry. So I'll just give you one example. So we know that one of the biggest problems in our area is waste, you know, waste management. And also trying to see how we can use waste to create income streams. So for example, from waste, you can create something good in some cases, which you can use for something else. So it's about you know, greening the economy and so forth. So you identify that problem, then you bring in students from the university, from other partners that we collaborate with, from industry partners, where we, uh, the problem is identified, they find a solution and uh, the industry partners also help them to see whether you know that, that uh, what they come up with is something that is viable in terms of a business that they can do, um, uh, that's just one example. But obviously, other examples include you know trying to there, there could be a social problem, let's say where students can't have data, and we've got IT students who are really great. So what solutions can they come up with to help other students? Again, that group would be made up of students from our sector. Some German students, we even had some German students judging our students on some of the ideas. That was very interesting, actually. And then some industry partners coming in thinking, well, that might work, that might not work. And, um, you know, so it's just having places where you can distract uh, students from just thinking about, you know, their exams, uh, the due dates for the tests, and having spaces where they can still create um, something, an idea, come up with an idea and have prototypes, uh, which they can then develop later on into something that can work. It is uh, obviously our first year in terms of the social innovation hub, but I must say that it has really, I think that there's a lot of interest and um, I really want us to, from our university side, it's an area which I think we can expand to try and work with others. Uh, I should also mention just one thing, uh, we, we the online collaboration, and I don't know in the, uh, in Finland, what it's like. So in our case, we see internationalization is a very important aspect to encourage cultural exchanges among students. Now, the question is, how do you do that during COVID-19? And it's not just a matter of saying, well, it's cultural exchange, but how do you promote teaching and learning uh, all these ideas while you cannot travel? 
So the online collaboration actually means that, for example, like what we are doing now, I can attend a class, say, in Canada, but we have some formal arrangements with that university. And we found that the students from the different classrooms, when they meet in these um, online classrooms, uh, they feel more motivated. And even when we put them in groups for projects, we pair them, not just with students from their own country, from their own classroom, but with students from another country, you know, to do joint learning. And I think for the academics also, it's really great because we found that uh, the academics who are involved in these initiatives um, actually really enjoy them. And it has been, I think uh, those help in some ways to distract you from the, the current normal situation, which is quite difficult for everybody as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sibu Siso. Um, I wholeheartedly agree that um, the type of positive disruption and uh, creativity and encouraging students to, let's say, make a mind shift towards positive things, to look at what's possible, um, to be geared towards the future, entrepreneurship, um, all types of things that would motivate and encourage students are easy ways to actually mitigate some of the isolation issues and the hopelessness that youth can feel and also adult students can feel in the midst of the crisis. So I'm glad to hear what all you've done and we can certainly all learn from that. Um, if we think about the isolation and silos, that's actually um, the third panel question. But before we go to the actual question, let's again view the third poll question and the results. So we were asking whether our audience has good practices for mitigating the social challenges of online learning. And 57% um, say no and 43% say yes. So it means that at least half of us have something great that we could share and we can build upon together. And um, I always feel that um, the real innovation comes from sort of mix mixing and matching solutions because not necessarily the solution as such is good for every country, but we can all learn and benchmark and then build upon that and find solutions that um, do work in our context. So if there is a link, something you'd like to share, I would like to encourage you to share it in the chat. And of course, you can always approach UNESCO Univoc after this session as well by sharing. I know that um, when the COVID-19 situation started, um, UNESCO and uh, many other organizations shared lists of um, different um, learning resources, content and whatnot. But of course, it could be overwhelming as a situation from a teacher's point of view, how to find something concrete from that long list of resources and how to find the time to dive into all of that and find what your own learners need. So I believe that this sort of um, uh, community to community, teacher to teacher uh, support and networks are really important because whether you're a student or a teacher, you need the sort of social support and uh, belonging to communities. And I believe that communities have been one way to support people um, in the midst of the crisis. But um, Getting to our third question, Paola, I'd like to ask you to comment. How can we ensure that learning does not deepen isolation and silos? Are there good practices that you would like to share with us? And uh, I know that Paola had a couple of slides, so please, Paola. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, Thank bien. you very much. Well, the word isolation leads me to March 13, 2020, when the president of Uruguay told all families of the country that both students and teachers should study and teach from home. They would no longer hear the bell ring at the end of recess or their fellow students, their, their classmates talking. So everybody was used to going to school, but the tools used by teachers in the classroom should acquire a new role, should enable continuous learning. The platforms, video conferences, and interactive walls have established invisible 
bridges, putting together families, teachers, administrative t staff, and the students. There were many factors that fostered the link and studying continuity. The SABAL plan is a program for children. So most students of the country could continue to connect, could remain connected, and it would also assist teachers by delivering laptops. Through the plan, each student from primary level got a laptop so they could work using the CREA platform. And the Uruguay Educa portal provided multimedia content for all subsystem and Zen training courses at secondary level. Training to teachers was still encouraged, the use of platforms as well as social networking to continue in touch with several students because they were only in online classes. What to do with students who couldn't join, who weren't able to join or to connect the public Education Ministry, alongside SABAL plan, created TV transmedia settings to enable students to watch the shows in open TV, but with education content with a certain curricula. The program, let's say, was called I'm from Uruguay, Time to Learn. So throughout the education cycle, we created an innovative proposal to work not only with the student, but to also encourage a space where the family should follow through the content alongside the student. And other education transmedia proposals were found, such as we had a YouTuber and a gamer, we had influencers from Uruguay, so the teenagers could follow and could identify they so they could relate and we also brought them closer to the tool by doing so as a mechanism as a means to an end the possibility of providing laptops and software to the students was a significant part of this but in order to prevent isolation the public education ministry also concentrated its energy on accompanying teachers through video conferencing and multidisciplinary teams with psychologists and social workers who worked throughout the country and by individualized inboxes and from the Uruguay Educa portal. Next slide, please. We thought about doing this from different perspectives, and this affected teachers, students, families. That's why in secondary school, we worked on a web page called Liceo en Casa. We provided the training for families and students to know how to use different digital tools. We supported everyone. We wanted to show that we're all teaching together and that we are all giving whatever we can from our space. So we want to provide the community all the information they need guiding, updates, materials, etc. In addition to that, we're offering an interaction space and a place in which children with disabilities can attend. The idea is to support everyone. Information exchange was key as part of this process. The teachers were sharing valid strategies and we had different webinars that we did for secondary and high school teachers. Then we also had webinars for all types of teachers with the Educa platform. The idea was to show that teachers were not alone either. Uruguay Educa is an educational portal. In addition to generating open resources for everyone, we are showing that we have teachers that are specialized and they were helping other teachers. The communications department worked a lot as well because it was 
offering different proposals for students. So we are always supporting the education communities. We have different contests for children to participate. We have stories that are being offered to everyone. So according to what I've heard, doesn't matter the tool we use, but it's important that we allow others to see that we're not alone. Thank you very much. Maybe you're muted, we can't hear you. Ah, sorry. So I was saying, Paola, um, it sounds great. You had a platform that served and supported everybody. And uh, also you went viral with YouTube videos and whatnot. So you really wanted to be approachable for the learners and for the learners and parents and all uh, stakeholders to find you. So I think the keep it simple format to find a platform so people don't have to roam around the internet to find things is a very good approach. And again, a very tangible approach that um, we can all learn from. Yanni, I would like to ask um, if you have uh, comments, um, something that you would like to share on the isolation and silos. Thank you. Paula had many, many good and important point of views and topics. Gracias a ustedes. And I, I found some similarities in our country and our evaluation project. Um, in our survey, we asked teachers and counselors what good and best practices have been invented and implemented during uh, COVID time and distance learning. And uh, many teachers said that a digital leap has been taken. They meant that their own personal skills have improved in dig digital teaching. Uh, they had experienced that their organization and teacher teams had developed their skills to organize training and education together with distance tools and environments. And uh, many teachers said that now they have a lot of online learning materials that can be used in, in the future as well. And um, although the situation as a whole has been challenging, many good practices emerged and uh, were developed anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Yanni. And actually our fourth question is about organizational level support. Um, let's first um, take a minute to view the results of the fourth poll question. So according to your answers, there has been a major increase in teachers' workload. And I think that um, this is an issue that we will have to um, look upon and see what we can do in the future in terms of if we are again caught by surprise, caught by a situation that is such a disruptive uh, or has such a disruptive impact on our everyday life in teaching and learning, what can we take away from the crisis? Um, given the insight that we have now, um, if we are considering organizational support. Denise, what's your experience? How can the organizational level decisions help reduce this workload, which seems to have been tremendous? Um, how can we actually make our learners and teachers more comfortable with these type of leaps that we had to take and possibly will take in the future? Uh, thank you, uh, Mervy. It's a very good question. And in fact, in the chat box, I could see that quite a few people were asking similar questions. So the first thing to remember is that online learning, it's not new for colleges. Pre-pandemic, uh, many of them already had a strong culture of e-learning programs. What is new right now is that all programs had to transition online for an undetermined period of time. 
nobody knows right now. And this meant that faculty had to review their curricula and make pedagogical adjustments to teaching online. And there have been a number of strategies that we have seen here in Canada, in fact, to help reduce teachers' workload. So I will organize them in four categories. So first, what institutions did. So they delayed the start of the fall and winter semesters by one or two weeks to allow uh, faculty instructors to prepare for online uh, teaching. They also eliminated, many of them, non-essential administrative work for departments and programs. And we know there can be quite a few of those. They also provided release to some teachers to support their colleagues in developing pedagogical strategies for online teaching. So let me talk about what kind of support uh, was done from a pedagogical perspective. First, encourage teachers to focus on the essentials of competencies in their courses and remove redundancies. Augment support for teachers' professional development in what I called online pedagogy and in the use of various equipment as well as software. And uh, quite a few created what here in Canada we call faculty teaching commons, uh, where you can provide peer-to-peer -peer support and feedback uh, because we know it's an essential element to refine course design and delivery. And uh, what happened, this also fostered communities of practice and inquiry among larger groups of faculty to facilitate a culture of sharing ideas, resources, strategies. There was also development of dedicated resource website for instructors so that people had a one-stop shop uh, for teaching online. And this was, for example, how do I teach online? Uh, and there was even information on that with respect to equity and access, communicating with learners alternatives to lectures, alternatives to lab activities. How do I indigenize online teaching? And also copyright considerations because that's an important aspect. The second thing that you could find on those website were information, again, one-stop shop on technology tools to help instructors to get courses up and running, whether they use Brightspace, Kaltura, Zoom, Office 365, and all the rest. Assessment options. This is a question that in fact was raised also in the chat box. So that, that, that website uh, has um, options for instructors beyond the traditional exams for evaluating student progress. And this could be, you know, how to implement quizzes, for example, how to do exams online, and how to ensure that it is the real person that is answering. There were also on, on those website, uh, professional development recordings. So recordings, uh, could be on how to do a Zoom class, how to do breakout rooms in my class, how to motivate learners, to, and, and how to motivate them to be on camera, not to put uh, just a black screen. 
and uh, there was also how to to do active learning for remote classrooms and of course library resources but the other thing that is important i just talk about support from a pedagogical point of view but there's also the support for technical programs hands on as both sibu so and i talked about earlier so this is you know what, the biggest challenge to move online. But, you know, uh, people uh, have been creative. So there's even some that develop kits that they send to students at home to gain hands-on experience. And what happened, the use of these kits has made it easier to deliver technical curriculum. I've already talked about augmented and virtual reality, but there were things also for programs, for example, in computer science and applied arts, where uh, people were able to have access to specialized equipment and software to allow more flexibility in the teaching. And I cannot not talk about wellness uh, because uh, faculty, you know, we, we often talk about students, but it, it's the same for faculty. Um, a lot of issues, you know, everybody feels insecurity, anxiety, not knowing, um, and so uh, what happened is that uh, it has been critical for instructors to, to take care of themselves and for organizations to provide resources for, to ensure that instructors take care of themselves. Because, you know, uh, we all know that there has been stress and when they're stressed, this can have a negative uh, impact on physical, emotional, social, and psychological uh, wellness. So many institutions, what they did, they have created or provided access to wellness resources for staff, including wellness podcasts and videos on topics such as positive psychology, wellness strategies, uh, strategies for sleep, uh, or strategies to create a positive mindset uh, or resilience and so on. So uh, a lot has been done. I I'm not saying that things have been perfect, but certainly you, you could feel a lot of uh, empathy from organizations and a lot of willingness to find solutions and to support each other. Thank you, Denise. Um, some of the, um, let's say, good practices that you mentioned are fairly simple. So cut the red tape, give people more time, <laughs> um, big ears, so hear their anxiety, hear what they're saying. I mean, it's not really rocket science. It's really about the keep it simple and focus on what's important. So the people, the learning, supporting this, being um, there for your colleague, um, supporting them for, let's say, professional development in using the tools and how to do things. Um, so again, that part is not really complicated. Um, Paola, would you like to comment? I mean, how much of this resonates with what you did in your organization and the good practice in your country? Bueno, sí, este, hay muchas similitudes. Este, well, we have many similar things. Last year and this year, we have learned a lot. First, we learned how to do teamwork. We learned how to take care of each other. We saw that teachers who in general are now doing many more things than just being teachers had to accompany students during this process, during this very complex context. Of course, we also need to understand all different situations that students are facing. That's why one of the most important elements was thinking about accompanying teachers from the beginning, 
having multidisciplinary teams. And we were creating strategies to help teachers to know how to face situations that they could face online. We issued different guidelines. In secondary school, for example, we realized that if we have clear guidelines from the beginning, teachers were feeling better. They were able to trust themselves. And we helped teachers to decide what were they going to do according to the new needs. So this year in my country, we created what we call bi-modal, mixed or combined guideline for teachers. Teachers usually say, I am going to answer WhatsApp until 2 a.m., but that's crazy because I'm working now more than I did before. But yeah, before this new reality, we need to do changes. So now we're trying to use the support of experts. We aim to support teachers and professors so that they can plan better how to work from far away, how to do things to motivate and encourage students to work as a team, how to exchange information and exchange good practices. And we want teachers to know that video conferences are not the only tool. There are many other platforms. I mean, there are key platforms that teachers and the faculty can use. So we truly want to help teachers to learn this so that they can work easier. In Uruguay, talking about the organization, we worked with a pedagogical team. It was a group of experts that created guiding documents. And these guiding documents were for specific times of the year, for example, one document for tests and exams, one document talks about how to create digital notebooks. So for us, having communication was always key, communication through the institutional website. We have always had clear guidelines and then those guidelines are sent via institutional emails. And yeah, the idea is never losing touch. We are also promoting key communities and how can those communities be addressed through different platforms. We also wanted to define roles, psychologists, social workers, teachers, what they should all do. And we are also thinking about working as a team, sharing experiences, generating consensus within all different groups. That's very important for us to do within educational institutions. We all need to do this together and we also need to have clear references. That's something that has been helping the faculty. And of course, we also need to understand what are the specific roles of the inspectors because we have inspectors that were helping teachers. I mean, for us, working together is key. And I wanted to say this at the end, we need to rethink our classrooms and we need to learn how to listen to our students. We need to know what's encouraging for them and what's not. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paola. Um, it seems that um, we can learn a lot from each other's good practice. And um, we all share the fact that both our students and our teachers need to be seen and heard as individuals, as people, and who have their concerns, who have their strengths and weaknesses. And um, if we are there to support them, our organizations are there to support them. And we have um, time for that. We have the diversified support needed because people are on different levels. We're not on the same bandwagon on this. So that's something we just have to take into consideration because otherwise we just add to the anxiety and stress. But with simple and clear solutions and by encouraging the formation of communities of learning and communities of practice, we're a long way in, let's say, hitting a home run on this one. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists for the rich and very insightful discussion we've had. And uh, now I'd like to raise a couple of questions from the Q&A box and the chat. Um, there were a couple of um, comments on the fact that TVET is about practical learning, hands-on, brick and mortar. How on earth can we digitalize this experience? 
And the other question I'd like to raise is about the quality of digital learning and about um, how attractive we can make it to the learners so that they don't feel disengaged and unmotivated. Um, who would like to address the quality issue and the fact that um, brick and mortar, digitalizing that is of course a big issue. Can I, can, I ask, can I ask Denise to comment first? Yes, uh, sure. Uh, so, you know, at the, at the beginning of the pandemic, okay, of, of course, the first week, you know, oh my God, what do we do? And so people adapted. And at one point, there were some people thinking, oh, maybe that's the new way. Guess what? Students, learners said, no way. <laughs> this is not the new way because we want the interaction in person. What this is showing us, though, is that the new world won't be the same either. It will not be like it was before. I think it is uh, Janet who talked about, or maybe you, Murphy, who talked at one point about synchronous and asynchronous we, we uh, are asking learners right now in the colleges, what is it that they want moving forward? And many are saying they would like a combination. So the hybrid model. So, uh, and this is interesting because it means that what we are doing today, we will be able to use part of it moving forward as well. So now to answer your question, um, we know that when you do TVET, uh, most of it is hands-on. So uh, there are portions you can do, you know, without hands-on, but a lot you cannot do. We know that uh, virtual and uh, reality and augmented reality is part of the solution, but it costs, and I will give the amount in Canadian dollars, so I'm sorry for that, but we know that five to 10 minutes can cost about 15 uh, to $25,000. This is costly, especially if you need a lot of those. So, and what we did, we did a study in Canada uh, about, my God, we were probably five months into the pandemic and we thought we, we need to find a better way because everybody cannot reinvent the wheel. So we did the survey uh, in our country and we asked people who had such tools, would they be interested in sharing it? And uh, what, if we were to develop more, would they be interested? And which professions were most urgent? And uh, they identified three professions, in fact, of the health sector. <laughs> we're not surprised by that because health sector is quite important. And these varied like respiratory therapy, lab technicians, and so on. And so what we are doing now we are developing tools to do simulations. We are developing tools to do a virtual reality and augmented reality. And after, and those will be developed by our members and they will be shared on a common platform. So anybody will be able to use it. So it means that maybe at the end, you end up with at least one of those per course, which becomes very in interesting. So I'll give you an example of respiratory therapy of what one of our college did. It's so cool. And I keep using it as an example. So it's about respiratory therapy. They, in that class, they teach five different sicknesses. Uh, but of course, even when you are in person, and that's why they invented that tool. It's hard to find five people that have that sickness that day that you're teaching it. So what they did, they came up with a, a, a virtual reality and you pretend that you're touching a person so you can see the back of a person. And then until your hands are well positioned and then you hear five different types of a breathing, 
to, to allow you to identify which one is which. So I'm giving that one to you as an example, but we cannot envisage all those purple dots in my back developing such a tool. It wouldn't make sense uh, and it, it, it would not be efficient, but let's see if you have one that has developed it and then you made it available to everybody. That's how you improve the quality of digital learning. So I'm touching your two, your two questions right now. And with respect to quality of digital learning, it's not only the tools, but I, I, I dare to say it's how you engage students. Because if there's no, no strategy to engage students, the, the course will not be successful. Thank you. So you strongly believe that if we use our imagination and we use the digital technology in all of what is available, we can indeed build high quality and engaging digital learning. Yeah. We just need to step away from the traditional and look at learning from a new aspect. Um, I think that's very interesting and I totally share your belief that the future of digital learning is something we haven't necessarily experienced yet. When we go to the augmented and the virtual environments and truly immersive solutions, that's when we're looking at the future of digital learning. But um, I think we're taking baby steps now and definitely the pandemic has pushed us in that direction. But of course, we should not forget as has been already mentioned several times, the fact that not everybody has access. Um, not everybody has the means. So we need to look at this from a very, let's say, balanced point of view in terms of having the new developments and then ensuring that people will be able to get there and we are able to share all of this because as you said it's not very cheap to um, go into the development mode of all these different solutions but of course that's why we have unesco univoc that's why we have the learning communities and each other and we should empower each other and engage more in learning from each other but um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. I'd like to thank everybody, our participants and our panelists for this wonderful session. It's been um, remarkable and all that we have learned here, I believe that um, will take us again a step forward. But um, I'd like to now wrap up and uh, we'll hear closing remarks from Jens. Well, thank you, Mervi, and a big thank you to our panelists for sharing their examples and insights, and especially also to the students who have provided their perspectives in the video contribution on how digital learning affects them. I think that was very inspiring. It was also a really rich discussion and interesting, so thank you very much for that. I think we were able to see today in our discussion that digitalization in TIVA teaching is much more than a technical challenge alone. And if we want to make a successful shift towards more digital learning and capitalize on the benefits that this shift can bring, uh, we have to find ways to support teachers and students alike to benefit from the pros of distance learning and to also tackle the cons. So today we've heard about isolation, anonymity and loneliness, mental health issues, motivational challenges, but also aspects related to the development of soft skills. And yet we know that digitalization and distance learning are clearly themes that will remain after COVID and um, it's likely to play a more prominent role in the future, whether it's mixed or uh, more prominent on its own, we'll have to see how it develops, but um, it's likely to stay uh, in a more prominent fashion. For many TVET institutions, the COVID pandemic was an accelerator to take a more serious step in this direction also. And for most, distance learning was implemented more like in an emergency response fashion as opposed to an implementation of a well-planned conceptualized process. And I think uh, um, the social dimensions that we see, the social challenges are also uh, a part of that. So I think learning from each other is going to be an important element to, uh, to uh, tackle these uh, problems that we had and uh, uh, we can move forward by learning from each other. So to improve digital services swiftly, 
uh, with all the benefits that it may have for uh, different individuals, we can learn a lot from uh, your practical examples and experiences. And we are always looking forward uh, to learn about your ideas and examples that you may have, especially those that have a replication value elsewhere. So if you have any interesting examples to share, please get in touch with us and let us know. Um, we're now coming to the end of this webinar, and I would like to thank you once again for your interest and for your, uh, for your participation. And I would like to take uh, the opportunity to invite you uh, to our next webinar on 20th of May on navigating the maze of digital tools and services, where we will look again a bit more at the technical aspects of uh, the digital learning challenge. And you will find the registration for this webinar shortly on the same page where you have found the registration for this one as well. I would also like to invite you to another online conference that is coming up in the context of our BUILD project on bridging Asia Pacific in Europe, where we will discuss new qualifications and competencies in TVET. This will take place next week on the 27th and the 28th of April. And the registration link is accessible from our webpage and my colleague Nicola has also just posted it in the chat. So we look forward to seeing you soon again in either of those conferences and events. And uh, thank you once again for joining. Goodbye. <laughs>